Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, listeners. Lisa and I are manning the podcast today while Deb is taking a wonderful trip out west with her daughter. And we're going to be examining the idea of Schadenfreude, which is a German word that combines harm and joy. And what it denotes is that sometimes, in all kinds of circumstances, people can observe somebody doing something or getting caught in something that's problematic or harmful. And sometimes the observer takes pleasure in that. This is something that's core to human beings. Clinical research has been done that suggests even young children can display pleasure as they watch another person in difficult circumstances or experiencing some kind of pain. In Proverbs, there is an admonition. Rejoice not when thy enemy falleth, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turn away his wrath from him. So thousands of years ago, 5,000 years ago, somebody saw enough of this pleasure and harm to put an admonition against it in one of our ancient cultural texts. We love to see this kind of thing happen, particularly when we have a sense that the person who has stumbled is not seriously hurt. So we'll watch those jackass movies with Johnny Knoxville and the guys take on these outrageous pranks and put themselves in ridiculous circumstances. We have a tendency to track the fall of famous and wealthy people and perhaps feel some satisfaction. They've got their comeuppance. And this says something about a deep strata of the human psyche. So we're going to circumambulate the idea of schadenfreude. And before we uh, do embark on this topic, I just want to remind listeners about our Patreon. Patreon's a platform where you can support us for a small amount every month that helps us cover the costs associated with producing the podcast. And in return, you get benefits that vary depending on your level of support, but can include uh, a chance to get your dream interpreted several chances per month or to ask us a question. And essentially, we produce little mini episodes for our patrons, and we, we do so every week. And again, depending on your level of support, you can enjoy extra dream episodes or questions. We've answered some really fascinating questions recently and done some really interesting dreams. And all of that can be yours if you support us on Patreon. So go to our website, thisunionlife.com, and uh, if you click on the podcast tab, you'll see a uh, place to check out our Patreon. So researchers have been really interested in this experience of schadenfreude, both in terms of it being evidenced in children, but also differentiating it from other what are called dark triad emotions, feelings that are in that realm of shadow, as Jung said. So there is some kind of beckoning mystery about this feeling that we keep looking at it. Yeah, I mean, schadenfreude is such an interesting topic that I think fascinates us, partly because it's just such a great word, <laughs> but also because I think we can all relate to it. And there is a lighthearted element to it, as you noted in your introduction, Joseph. There, there can be a lot of humor in it, both in the way that it can be funny to see another person stumble 
I mean, a lot of slapstick humor is kind of based on that. And there's a certain kind of dark humor in recognizing our own tendency for schadenfreude. You know, Nietzsche was one of the people who wrote about this. And he said, to see others suffer does one good. And then he said, to make others suffer even more so. This is a hard saying, but a mighty human, all too human principle. And I, you know, I, I think he's right. I mean, you brought up the quote from the Bible and, you know, this is certainly throughout time and place, uh, an element of being human. There is a saying in Japanese, the misfortunes of others taste like honey. There is this concept in all kinds of other cultures. At one point, an Englishman noted that there was no word for it in English because the, the English didn't feel it. But of course, that, that's not true. This is, this is universal. The English perhaps just wanted to believe that they didn't feel it. So it is a real window into shadow and an experience of our, our, our own shadow oftentimes when it comes up. When I think about that, in terms of Jung's theory of shadow, anything that the culture disallows or religion or the family disallows gets distanced some aspects of shadow are pushed so deeply down into the unconscious that it's unspoken and really invisible in the culture, coming back up in very, very strange ways. But schadenfreude looks like it's something that is pretty close to consciousness in as much as it's so nakedly displayed in so many areas. The fact that there's hundreds or thousands of movies and sitcoms and, as you were saying, jokes that one would say that even social media is driven in some large part by shaming someone or other for a perceived failure. And usually it's somebody that has been held in high regard. So it's, it's not hidden at all. It is often renamed so that it's marketed as a spin on it, but it seems like it's everywhere. You know, I want to say, I think there are a couple different flavors of schadenfreude, and I would agree with you that some are very out in the open, and others, I think, carry more shame, and maybe we can sort of differentiate between these different flavors, but... Let's talk about the first one in which uh, watching someone kind of get their comeuppance makes us feel really good. It, it addresses our innate sense of fairness in the world. We feel like this person deserved it. Uh, maybe they were been getting away with something and now they're going to get theirs. And uh, I just had an experience actually over the weekend. My husband and I were driving on the New Jersey Turnpike and, you know, we were kind of keeping up with the traffic, which means we were speeding a little bit. But someone whizzed by us, I mean, just barreling down the New Jersey Turnpike. And, you know, the guy had to have been doing 100 miles an hour. And, you know, I'm always full of righteous indignation when I see that because the person is clearly driving in a way that isn't safe. It's aggressive driving. They're often having to weave in and out. And, you know, you just, you just feel like that person is terrible. And a few minutes later, a cop car came whizzing by with his lights flashing. And both my husband and I said, wouldn't it be great if he got that guy? So we could see the stop ahead of us. We could see the lights flashing. And as we went by, we definitely looked. And yes, it was a white BMW SUV. And the cop got him. And, you know, both of us were howling and cheering because it it was this sense of... Um, fairness having been restored of someone who deserved a comeuppance getting his. And that can play a role, I think, for example, in how we can feel schadenfreude in the realm of politics. When they get some dirt on the other guy, we, you know, whether it's Trump or Biden, you know, we, we feel elated if that's not our guy. You know, it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm so glad that he's, you know, getting what he deserved. And we often do kind of shout that from the rooftops and we, and it, it feels so good. I think it, it makes us, it validates our shadow projection, I think is part of it. When, when we see someone 
who's transgressed getting their comeuppance. It does address our need for fairness in the world, but it also kind of validates our sense of who we are in the world because we have projected our shadow, of course, onto the other guy and we're not that. And we can see that that's the baddie and the baddie is getting punished. So it has a way of affirming our ego sense of ourself that it shores up our persona when we see the quote unquote bad guy get what we feel that he deserves. I can certainly identify with that feeling on the highway, um, particularly if somebody has sped by and startled me, then it feels like you know they should get their comeuppance because they've caused me some particular moment of distress. But I was also thinking as you were talking that there is a cost to being obedient, that there's these rules, let's say, how we're supposed to drive on the highway, and we have to negotiate with the parts of ourselves that would like to speed, that wants to cut somebody off because they're driving too slow, or we've had a bad day and we just feel incredibly frustrated because there's traffic, and wouldn't we love to just go onto the shoulder and zoom by 60 miles an hour and leave all those people behind? And we don't, generally speaking. So we're all in this kind of Saturnine suffering to follow the rules. So when somebody isn't following the rules, there's definitely that feeling of unfairness that I have to suffer Mm -hmm. this to drive at the speed limit. So I think the more contained, the more Saturnine structure that a person is under, I think makes them feel much more resentful when someone seems to be get away, getting away without the suffering limits that the observer has had to accommodate. It also goes to this idea of monitoring social equity, that when we see somebody get punished in some way, for breaking the rules, it also reinforces the guardrails for the people who are observing it. Yes, there is a little bit of a chuckle, but also we take that in and say, I would not like to be embarrassed like that. I don't want to be shamed in the public sphere. So it seems to serve some kind of cultural cohesion process. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. I think it it does uh, kind of keep, help to keep us in line a little bit. And we feel this relief. I think relief is one of the things associated with schadenfreude. I'm glad that's him and not me. Maybe I wanted to speed, but I didn't because I was choosing to be obedient and therefore distancing myself from my own desire to transgress. And then when I see the guy get caught, it's like, well, it's a good thing that I didn't transgress, isn't it? But psychologically, we've we've also done this thing where we've distanced ourselves from an impulse, projected it onto someone else, and then we can disavow having had it. So that probably helps to explain some of the energy behind the glee that we feel when someone else gets their comeuppance is maybe they were doing the thing that we wish we could do, but we were afraid we wouldn't get away with it. And seeing them get away with it just really burned. And and now we have this really satisfying sense of, ah, it's a good thing I followed the rules and didn't didn't pay attention to that impulse. So it has a social reinforcing quality Perhaps, as you said, it's a momentary kind of dopamine reward even that I followed the rule, they've gotten their comeuppance, there's that blush of pleasure. So it's both a negative and a positive reinforcement to kind of stay within a certain parameter of the culture. This is something that you were also mentioning in the political sphere, because Schadenfreude is evident in group dynamics. 
and in terms of the research about in-groups and out-groups, which have to do with social standing and social status. If we are strongly identified with a particular group, which could be a political party, it could also be being a fan of a certain team, football team, soccer team, that when we feel the competing team has somehow messed up, has done something silly, or there's an opportunity to to really get them, that kind of gotcha feeling, creates an enormous amount of delight in the group that's observing that, which tells us how strongly we can feel identified with a particular group that it can so powerfully affect our feelings about ourselves to be associated with the winner. And the winner is also the one that's not carrying shame. Yeah, shame is in here, isn't it? I found that there was a really terrific looking book that came out in 2018 by uh, Tiffany Watt Smith. And the name of the book is Schadenfreude, The Joy of Another's Misfortune. And uh, I uh, was able to read an excerpt of the book uh, prepping for our talk today. And she mentions this interesting research, which I think is very relevant to what you were just talking about, Joseph, where some uh, researchers hooked up some soccer fans in Germany to a machine that would uh, measure their smiles and frowns while watching TV clips of, of soccer. And what they noticed is that these football fans, European football fans, smiled more quickly and more broadly when their rival team missed a goal than when the German team scored a goal. So the pleasure at seeing their rivals fail was faster, deeper, more fulsome than their pleasure at seeing their team win. So it really says something, I think, I think it speaks to your issue about kind of in-group and out-group and are we on the winning side or are we, you know, the, the loser who's holding shame? That research is so important because there is a debate in our political sphere. Some people run what's called a clean campaign and what they're primarily bringing forward are all the positives that they believe they're capable of creating for the community, the state, the country. And then somebody else decides they're going to run a negative campaign, which is primarily about shaming and degrading their opponent. And the negative advertising, just as you said, often motivates people much more than the positive message, that it is more difficult to create a kind of cohesive movement towards the positive one for the most part. So people are making use of this phenomenon in human psyche. Another place we see this, of course, all the time is in social media. Anytime a social media influencer steps into that I'm calling someone out position. We are in that realm of schadenfreude, of taking pleasure in finding a flaw in another person. And it can create a kind of feeding frenzy of delight that people are not passing around that meme or that piece of information to keep the community safe, let's say, from somebody who is despotic. It's getting passed around because of that little dopamine hit that people get, that little thrill of shaming and degrading and catching someone else and bringing them down. Absolutely. And I think what a Jungian lens can bring to that insight is that what's going on there is shadow projection because we feel so gleeful that this person with whom we don't agree has been caught up. And again, we can dissociate, we can disallow or disavow 
whatever it is in ourselves that we've projected onto that person. And it's almost like the universe is in accordance with that when we see that person slip on a banana peel. And to be the one who is pointing it out in a large theater affords them a certain kind of status. We talk about this as virtue signaling, that by shaming another person and taking pleasure in it, yes, we've pushed our own shadow as well as cultural shadow into a particular figure. There's a sense of pleasure in that. But unfortunately, in our culture, there's also status and power that the person who is the accuser, the shamer, becomes slightly dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to fall afoul of the one who is able to cry witch and send the whole community at your door. So the person who has become influential because of their ability to shame achieves a kind of protection until such time as they display a weakness. And then all of a sudden, this ferocious turnaround often happens. A good example of that was that young fellow, Milo Yiannopoulos, who achieved a fair bit of fame as um, a gay conservative commentator who was often criticizing feminists, uh, liberals, any number of other kind of groups, and had achieved a kind of status until he himself suddenly became accused of inappropriate behaviors. And the turnaround happened with a kind of lightning speed that the protection that he thought was afforded by being the shaming one very quickly tumbled back onto him. So the, the shamer becomes the shamed, the trickster becomes the tricked, and it speaks to Jung's idea of the enantiodromia, that when a quality goes so far, it swings back at us in, in sometimes a different form. So we've been talking a little bit about the, this flavor of schadenfreude where we feel this self-righteous vindication or we feel smugness. We feel like the person deserved what he or she got and we can kind of whoop and holler. But let's look at another one for a second um, because it does definitely happen that we hear that someone that we love, that we care about, that we're close to has something bad happen to him or her and we feel this little, very uh, shameful frisson of, of pleasure or perhaps relief. Uh, so, you know, maybe, for example, we're, we've been trying to get pregnant and we haven't been able to, and our best friend has gotten pregnant and we've had to kind of suffer with, a, with jealousy or, or envy or other dark feelings. And then she tells us that she's had a miscarriage. And of course, we do feel genuine grief and sorrow on her behalf, and we're worried about her. And, you know, but isn't there a part of us that thinks, oh, thank God? You know, I think that most of us, if we're being honest, would, would cop to that. And that experience of Schadenfreude, I think, is quite painful. It's usually really just suffused with shame. We're ashamed that we feel that way, understandably. But this is, this is very real, and it's very human. What strikes me about that example, Lisa, is how schadenfreude mediates envy. That between the two emotions, envy is actually much more painful. When we're feeling envious, we feel empty, we feel distracted. We often just feel terrible about whatever the envious object is. So in that scenario, the person who's trying to get pregnant looks at the friend who has, and they're a friend, so there's this enormous struggle going on to feel empathy and support, and then also feeling this deep 
dark, pernicious kind of envy. So the schadenfreude, that bit of pleasure in the failure of another, breaks somebody out of the envy cycle and also allows them to return to a sympathetic partner position. So now the friend who's struggling to get pregnant can console the one who has had a lost pregnancy and restore the relationship. So of the two, envy, I think, is the much harder burden to carry. Well, it, we're in the realm of misery loves company, as we say. Oh, yeah. That, that it, um, it's, if you're suffering, it's much easier to have someone who's suffering along with you. And of course, that's just a very normal, natural human thing. But it, it can act in our lives in ways in which we find ourselves actually wishing that someone also has a failure so that they can kind of come join us in the misery corner. I think when we realize that we're there, the challenge is to let ourselves acknowledge what we want rather than staying stuck in our own misery and hoping that people come down to our level, that we instead look at people that we that are flying high and say, well, what do I need? What can I learn from looking at that person? What do I need to claim for myself rather than uh, hoping that they, they stumble and fall and wind up back here with me? If you've read my book, uh, you'll know that my son had lead poisoning when he was a, a, a baby. And it was, it was really, really awful. And um, it was a serious case of lead poisoning and, and really, you know, it was a terrible, terrible time for me. And I remember telling moms about it, other moms with kids, my kids age, so young kids, toddlers, uh, you know, I, I kind of had to tell people because, you know, we had to move out of the house and that kind of thing. One of the most painful parts about the experience, and there were many of them, was when I would share what had happened to me with another mom, what I would see in her eyes and hear in her voice was, thank God that's not me. And I can certainly understand it, but it was a very painful thing because it made me feel so isolated. It made me feel on the outside of the human experience. So I think that, you know, putting myself in their shoes, you know, the sort of schadenfreude, now we're in the, the territory of kind of relief. You see something awful happen to someone else and you think in a way that's, I mean, again, it's just totally so understandable. There's nothing, there's nothing bad about it. But what you feel is you do feel, oh, God, thank God I'm not you. That othering process. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, is, it is othering. And, of course, other feelings come up, too, like empathy and, you know, a wish to console. But that little flicker of, of something like happiness, that, well, I'm, my day may not be going well, but at least that's not me. Mm -hmm. I can imagine some of the listeners sinking into these examples and feeling a little vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is of difficult them, it territory. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's difficult to face. It's difficult to remember incidences when we've been on the receiving mm -hmm. side of feeling someone had a sly smile when we had um, failed in some fashion. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to be on the receiving end, and it's also really painful to recognize that we do that too. So here's a little selection from the uh, book that I was mentioning before. Um, she says, of course, there is the inner triumph of seeing a rival falter. The other day in the campus coffee shop, a colleague asked if I'd got the promotion I'd gone for. No, I said, and I noticed at the corner of his mouth the barely perceptible twitch of a grin before the tumble of commiserations. Oh, bad luck. Oh, their loss, the idiots. And I was tempted to ask, did you just smile? But I didn't. Because when he loses out, as he sometimes does, I know I experience a happy twinge too. So a real confrontation with shadow, to admit that to ourselves, that even with people that we dearly love sometimes, the people most important to us, sometimes we feel something like relief or happiness when they slip. One way to lean into that is the possibility that if somebody feels any kind of threat 
around their inferiority. They can suppress the pain of feeling inferior by ferreting out, discovering, or prioritizing the fail, failures of others, that it actually cycles back into them to give them a temporary sense of relief. So there's this dance between these inner and outer objects. I mean, the solution around this is a deep investigation around our own sense of inferiority. Mm -hmm. Why do I feel so less than? Because I think that when we are feeling very full, yeah. and particularly very aligned with the self, so that whatever we are engaged with feels very vital and dynamic and deeply satisfying, then we're much less concerned about what other people do or don't have or how they seem to be enjoying one thing or another. It seems to be proportional in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think you've just put your finger on something that, that, that noticing these feelings of schadenfreude often indicate that there's some inferiority or insecurity or envy and that that can be an invitation to query where, where we're not aligned with what the self wants for us, which, which I think was the point I was trying to also get out a few minutes ago when I talked about, you know, sort of misery loves company. Well, be careful if that's too strong, because it, it might be that you're just trying to apply a palliative to your own deep sense of discontent in your life, rather than taking a stand for what, what you really need. So you're, you're absolutely right, Joseph. I think when we feel these feelings come up, you know, the right way to relate to them is, first of all, be honest. Y yes, mm -hmm. I felt that. Mm -hmm. And not too hard on yourself. Yes, this is very human, and we all feel it. We have all this evidence that we've offered today that this is a universal experience. And then we could say, and what, what of it that it's so hard for me to feel happy about my partner getting a promotion. You know, what, what, what might that mean for me? And uh, to, to see if we can use it somehow. What comes up for me in that example is cultivating the vicarious participation in another person's joy. That it's also normal for parents at times to feel envious of their children and even envious when the child is really succeeding, uh, to recognize you know, one's daughter is very beautiful and very smart and talented in multiple ways. The son is an athlete, and he's brilliant, and he's getting a scholarship to Harvard. That there is a very human feeling that parents will have that they've been left behind, that they were never afforded such benefits, they never achieved these heights. One theory about why parents, or rather how parents protect themselves from orchestrating the downfall of their own children, frankly, is to feel that some part of themselves is in the child, that the child in some ways is an extension of the parent, and therefore the goodness that comes to the child also comes to them. And I don't mean that in the way that uh, narcissistic extensions can go too far. But this is that healthy kind of narcissism, that part of you is alive in the child, and in that, in that way, their successes are our successes, mm -hmm. and that can kind of quiet that envy and schadenfreude curiosity. Mm -hmm. I think it is actually the rare parent who feels really okay about being surpassed by their kid. So m most of us feel some kind of mixed feelings about seeing our kids be more beautiful, more successful than we are. And, and so, yeah, we might even feel schadenfreude when our kid is, you know, disappointed in some aspect of life. Again, a very difficult thing to admit that you might feel that. You're right, Joseph, when, when you're feeling, um, when you, you can kind of cultivate that largeness of, of heart 
to see that what benefits you also benefits me and I can I can enjoy your your successes too. Coming back to that um, parental attitude that's mixed, you know, I th- I think about a phrase that I certainly heard in my childhood, more so from my grandparents, was "Don't get too big for your britches," mm, mm-hmm. which is that that little. Let me cut you down. Yeah, knocking you down a bit, which I think actually is a defense against the caregiver's envy or don't shine too much so that we can stay on par with each other Mm -hmm. and not evoke those darker feelings. I also want to bring up another um, piece uh, that Nietzsche said about this, that um, Schadenfreude acts as a kind of imaginary revenge. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm really thinking about that, that when somebody has done us harm in some way or made us feel psychologically pained, mm-hmm. that imagining the other person in similar pain because of a circumstance somehow mediates our wounds yeah, that feels that feels really, really right. And in that sense, it's a much more constructive response. I mean, if we go back to my silly example on the New Jersey Turnpike this past weekend, so the guy zips past us and we feel startled or frightened or angry or small somehow because he's made us feel like we're driving too slowly. You know, maybe there's an impulse to want to chase him, ram his car in, you know, pull him out of his car and beat him up. And it's a much more kind of pro-social response to just shout and holler when the cop naps him. It's like I can kind of outsource my need for revenge to the universe and let the universe mete out the just punishment. Quite so, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Being able to feel satisfied that there's some equity has been restored it also reminds me of that particular bit of that movie that came out in the mid '90s called "The First Wives Club," where uh, several women who had been through a divorce are observing their husbands' new lives and, and feeling quite negative about it, and orchestrating the downfall of the ex-husband in these very madcap ways, of course that intense naked pleasure i mean the the delight the laughter that the women share in the movie as their ex-husbands are you know in all kinds of uh, terrible circumstances as a result of their interventions speaks to this idea of revenge mhm you didn't even have to meet it out right you, you could just you could just enjoy it right one of the uh ex-wives uh, convinces the IRS to do this massive audit of her husband who has had shady dealings. So she's stepping back. Mm-hmm. You know, the IRS is the one who's going to yeah. create all this misfortune. But she's there with a champagne glass, toasting with the other women in the club, feeling this enormous sense of pleasure. So again, it's, it is a way of, of satisfying that feeling for vengeance, which can be so consuming for some of us. One of the mediating factors which we've danced around is empathy and sympathy. That if there is someone in our sphere that we are connected to and have a kind of empathic relationship with, that mediates schadenfreude tremendously it's it's hard to imagine someone else's pain and at the same time to lighten it mm-hmm. that they seem to be in something of an inverse relationship and of course if we have suffered a similar fate to the one who is now being publicly embarrassed or is in a state of pain it's difficult to be so distant as to delight in another's suffering Mm -hmm. 
that we know so well right. in our own hearts. So empathy, sympathy, and an ability to access our own memories of suffering very much mediates the pleasure or the desire to facilitate misfortune in another person. Well, and also this notion of uh, kind of humility. You know, when when my kids were little, it, it was so common, at least among the moms that I knew, to kind of experience schadenfreude around parenting issues. So two moms would get together and say, oh my God, did you hear what happened to her kid? I mean, you know, that kid has always been out of control. I mean, I think he has ADHD and he's not medicated and the school wants him to leave now. And, you know, there's some kind of uh, shiver of pleasure or whatever that goes through as, as you're talking about this. And then I remember talking to someone who, who was a little bit older and, and she said she was talking about some difficult experience that some parent was having. And she said, well, you know, you, you never know where, where things are going to go and you don't know who people are going to become. And, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen to my kids and I don't know what's going to happen to her kids. And I thought, well, that is, that is a, a much larger perspective to be holding and one that encompasses real humility. So another antidote to schadenfreude in that same vein is there but for the grace of God go I which is uh, just such an incredibly powerful acknowledgement that I could be next. And I think that schadenfreude, in fact, is a defense against the existential vulnerability that we all have. When we see someone suffer, we want to distance ourselves from the experience that the sufferer is having. And so we feel this sense of you know, self-righteous justification that, that fate has spared us, presumably because we believe we deserve to be spared, rather than admitting that we could be next. We could be the next person that the cop nabs. We weren't driving an, at the speed limit. We were speeding too, you know. We could be nabbed next. And of course, that's also true for much darker things too. So that humility that we could cultivate, that we all can be on the downside of fortune's wheel at times. If we really know that, then we're less likely to triumph when it happens to someone else. I think that's so right on. I was thinking when you started speaking about how common gossip is, and all forms of gossip are a kind of schadenfreude, passing around some little bit of dirt about somebody or other. And Spill the tea. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And to notice that when we hear about certain misfortunes, that there is a shiver of fear mm -hmm. that goes up our back. And that shiver of fear is that empathic alignment with the other that that misfortune could be very close or may be very close to us. And that's where that humility, that capacity to imagine ourselves in other people's circumstances kind of comes in. And as you said, how difficult that is to want to sit in that, to feel that vulnerable, and the various ways that we push that vulnerability aside when I look at social media about the kinds of accusations that people toss around and the message that that gives to other people, you know, it, it creates a very complicated strangulation. Mm -hmm. it, it collapses what's possible. It collapses the space to experiment and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that can really lock us up, particularly when we're young. The idea that people are waiting for us to fail yeah, because it is so juicy for them, so delightful. And then to have that demonstrated tens of thousands of times in social media, which kids are very, very connected to, it keeps shrinking the space. Because when we feel like the world is really dangerous, that it's 
filled with schadenfreude. Mm -hmm. it, it creates this feeling that all other people are somehow waiting for us to fail mm -hmm. and delighting in it. And when that gets internalized as an atmosphere, the best solution is to be small and invisible. Right. And boy, it's difficult to, for a young person to kind of claim their piece of the pie, to get out there in the world and take a position in this feeling that there's inadequate support. Yeah, I mean, as as you and I spoke about before we hit record this morning, you know, one of the the great spectacles of Schadenfreude in the political realm in the past number of decades was Bill Clinton's comeuppance, and then of course that took us to Monica Lewinsky, who was the object of Schadenfreude herself. Uh, you know, I think people really delighted in seeing her. Oh gosh, get just get so trashed and. Uh, just how how incredibly painful that must have been. And I think both you and I feel a lot of admiration for the way that her psyche has shown resilience to that experience. If people are not in touch with their own experience of being humiliated, it's easy to watch that as a form of theater mm -hmm. and not have any connection. I can just imagine myself in her shoes and, and the incredible, excruciating oh. <laughs> humiliation of being asked. It's like, it's being, like being slayed alive. Oh, my God. You know, having congressmen wanting to know these incredibly intimate details about your body. And it's, Oof. if we imagine ourselves into people's experience, it just takes any of that uh, schadenfreude and just evaporates mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right when you when you really can empathically enter the other person's experience in your imagination it, that kind of evaporates doesn't it you know i want to bring up another flavor of schadenfreude which is as it relates to rivalry mm -hmm. because it is true that there are certain aspects of life for probably just about all of us and including certainly most mammals that involves the, the, the need to be tested and figure out where you fit in the hierarchy. And, you know, this is an, an aspect of, uh, not, it certainly doesn't encompass all of life, but whether it's who's going to get the promotion at work or who's going to, you know, win the really attractive woman or who's uh, going to garner more admiration there this is this is a real thing and so if we happen to be jockeying for a position let's say and we find out that one of our rivals just had something bad happen to him we feel gleeful because it means maybe that we have a better chance so again i think this is very normal very human and uh it's just kind of another flavor of schadenfreude where we can feel happy to see a rival stumble because it may mean uh, that we have a better chance of winning the day. Well, and I think that happens so casually. You know, there's you know, a lovely young woman in the office and there's several men that are competing for an opportunity to date. You know, if they see a rival who's gotten a little bit of leverage there, Someone will come in and share every dark story, every embarrassing thing they can know about the rival to diminish their perceived value. So that is very much involved in this jockeying for opportunity and this idea of diminishing the other person. And of course, you know, one of the problems with that is that sometimes that need to see or that desire, let's say, to see another person fail as we're striving for something, it extends out beyond people who are truly rivals. I mean, I, I think the world of sports, this it's kind of the clearest place where if we really, really want our team to win, and let's say their primary rival, uh, you know, gets um, loses against a, another team, we're really happy because that just, 
increase the chances that our team's going to make it to the playoffs or whatever. It's just very kind of clean and everyone knows what to expect. And these feelings are absolutely okay in that realm. But if I'm trying to achieve a certain goal, for example, and I really don't have any rivals, the only person I'm really competing against is myself, but I find that I want other people to fail anyway. That's, that's where it starts to, to turn into something that is, yeah, we're really in the realm of shadow. Absolutely. That this jockeying, whether it's for a group, for ourselves, for an opportunity, and how status is shifted around. So maybe the fact that the other person had a specific problem, overcame an addiction, or had some kind of financial failure earlier in life may not particularly excite us, but if we can then weaponize it and shift our own status or opportunities, there is something inside of us that feels it's justified and also tends to minimize the damage that it causes. And apparently, researchers have found this behavior in children by about five or six years old. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. there's an instinct, or dare we say an archetype, mm -hmm. around jockeying for position. To me, it feels like the archetype has something to do with status. Yeah, yep. And the various methods that we as human beings use to shift our status. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I could imagine that absolutely is tied to this ancient impulse to survive, that if we have higher status, we are more likely to thrive. Mm -hmm. I think that schadenfreude is important because it reveals parts of our psyches that are often hidden and that we don't want to know about. Along those lines, I am wondering if, if we were to really take a fearless personal inventory and Notice the kinds of misfortune that delight us. To do that categorically, that there are certain kinds of missteps that a person has which makes us kind of squeal with delight versus other misfortunes that we could barely pay attention to. I think that's a way that we can begin to get a sense of where our own shadow is most invested. From Jung's standpoint, anything that elicits a disproportionate intensity of response, pleasurable or painful, gives us information about what's most dynamic inside of ourselves. So, for instance, our culture, particularly right now, is so sexually repressed. There's so much hyper-monitoring and so much threat right now that is covering instinctive sexual behavior that it can create an enormous, almost lurid delight in sexual misdeeds. And I think that's in proportion to the amount of repression and denial that people have about their own sexuality. I have friends that are or have developed substantial careers on Wall Street in various levels of finance. It's interesting when I have time to socialize with them, they will prioritize a delight in financial misdeeds. They're the ones who are not talking about who got caught having an affair, you know, over in Hollywood. But boy, they will delight in outlining the people that uh, bilked money, ran a Ponzi scheme, got busted for spiriting away enormous amounts of money. So there is some story that we're holding that prioritizes the valence of the various things that seem delightful. There is a phrase that's rummaging around in my mind that I intuitively feel is relevant to our conversation. 
And most people have heard it in that television series, Westworld, where androids have been created and then are used to satisfy whatever dark impulses that people have to pay for that. And one of the androids says over and over again, these violent delights have violent ends. And that actually is a line that I recognize from Romeo and Juliet, that one of the friars, who perhaps is marrying them, but I don't quite remember, gives a little bit of a speech, this cautionary feeling, and he says, these violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die like fire and powder, which as they kiss, consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in his own deliciousness, and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore love moderately. Long love doth so. Too swift arrives as tardy as too slow. So I think the feeling there is that in being overly influenced by this violent delight, it does something to the soul. Yes, it's a shadow dynamic. Yes, children evidence it. Yes, it is archetypal and has all to do with the things we mentioned. But there's an enormous difference between episodic schadenfreude or when it becomes a personality trait, that it becomes a central attitude mm. that dominates the internal environment. And then that pleasure in harm is something that the unconscious can begin to constellate in our own lives, setting us up, tricking the trickster, sloshing us between pointing our finger outward and having fingers pointed at us. And when it becomes a trait, these violent delights have violent ends, which is something that should sober us. Mm. I, I think that you've, you've really landed something there, Joseph, something that's very important, that if we have to make sure this doesn't really take root even while we acknowledge that it's just human to have these feelings sometime. Before we turn to a dream, I would like to remind our listeners that Lisa and Deb and I have created a marvelous learning platform for those of you that have become very interested in dream work. We have curated a learning process which you can participate in. It will teach you the various Jungian elements with which to understand your dreams. It will offer opportunities to join dream groups and form them with people all over the world. There'll be an opportunity to meet each of us through the platforms, through question and answer periods through dream workshops and through one-to-one -one meetings. So for any of you that have really been called to the mystery of understanding dreams and really taking that capacity into your hands, please go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, click on the link Dream School, and just take a look at the offering, and we hope to see you there. And today's dream comes from a 23-year-old woman who works is, as a barista and is an aspiring artist. And here's her dream. 
I'm in my childhood bedroom with my boyfriend. He is lying on the bed and I am standing facing him. I am wearing lingerie, white fishnet stockings and a cobalt blue lace bra. I felt good about how I looked and I felt desired by him. There was sexual energy in anticipation. I said I'd be right back. I just needed to go to the bathroom. I exit the bedroom, turn the dark corner, and in the darkness, I stumble upon a creepy doll. She was hand sewn, looked like a kind of rag doll or like Sally from A Nightmare Before Christmas. And she notably had two embroidered circles on the top right of her head, which were unfinished, the needle and thread still hanging from them. I wasn't scared of the way she looked, but this doll evoked in me a faint sense of horror. Her presence felt jarring, emotionally charged, possibly ominous. I turned back around the corner with it in my hands to show it to my boyfriend. The dream ended here, and I did not get much of his reaction, though I feel like it was a less severe reaction than I was expecting. And here's the context. She says, I had this dream right before breaking up with my boyfriend of four years, which was an incredibly hard decision for me and one I am still questioning. I struggle intensely with indecisiveness in life. This was a huge decision and I don't even really understand why I've made it given all the love between him and me. Something in me has just been pushing this forward. She says, the main feelings in the dream were fear. She said, in the beginning, I felt lustful and coy. The appearance of the doll felt like a horror movie jump scare. The fear then sustained as great paranoia, unease, desperation, as I showed the doll, as though expecting some interpretation from him. There was something childlike about it, like when a child wordlessly shows his mother his wound. And uh, here's just a little bit more that might help us. She says, my boyfriend and I had an amazing and formative four years together. He has always offered me great comfort and support. He is an artist and he has been making hand-sewn stuffed animals. My childhood bedroom and house, he had the typical associations of childhood, though maybe a bit of a hauntedness being that my dad died tragically when I was young and my boyfriend always claimed to feel his presence in the house. I associate lingerie with sexiness and femininity. For me, I'm interested in several moments in the dream. Of course, we're in the childhood bedroom, so the setting gives us a hint that we might be dealing with a childhood complex, either some kind of a necessary regression in order to repair something. But there is a collision between the part of her that's quite young and then the part of her that's a mature woman. She is evidencing a kind of Aphrodite sexuality. She's confident. She's playful. She's having fun. But it's happening in the context of the childhood, which we could naturally imagine creates a certain kind of disharmony between those dynamics. And then she suddenly has an urgency that there's sexual energy and anticipation, but she needs to evacuate. There's a pressure in the body. Anytime we have dreams with urination or pooping, that we're in this realm of some tension that's building up and the ego is trying to find the right environment to express it, to relax, to to let go. Then we have this image, a symbol of the unfinished doll that changes the mood dramatically. She goes to the boyfriend, perhaps seeking, wanting help, and maybe by showing the doll, even gaining some kind of perspective on it that might relieve the sense of distress that she's having, and then the breaking up with the boyfriend. So the lens that I would put on this is that there is a father complex animus merger. And for all of us, Our parents are the primary archetypes. 
And often whoever the primary caregiver was is the most dynamic in the psyche. But from the mother archetype, all the female archetypes at some point differentiate. And from the father archetype, all the various categories of male archetypes separate out. So what I feel like in the dream, because there is this childhood trauma of loss of the father, that the animus, or the image of the boyfriend as the lover and the father archetype, are too close. So when the fear of the loss of the father, the grief of that loss, rises up, it perhaps inappropriately begins to influence the love object the animus. And I'm wondering, and again, this is pure hypothesis, if part of stepping away from the relationship with the boyfriend was brought on by this unresolved grief and loss, and that as the boyfriend became more and more precious, the fear of having that taken away might be powerful enough to want to step out of the whole situation, to not have to relive the traumatic separation. Well, it's interesting because I, I think I wound up in the same general ballpark that you did, um, maybe in a slightly different way. The thing is the doll, like you said, just dramatically changes the mood. And so there's the sense of this is the thing the dream is bringing. This is the surprise this is the new information and the new attitude. And it's something that's been forgotten about in the dark hallway that brings up a sense of horror. So what I did with that is, is I thought, okay, well, what, what could that be? You know, it's obviously something the ego is kind of defending against. Uh, the ego doesn't want to know about it. It's been in the dark hallway. So I, I wondered too, is it some feeling some feeling that's being defended against and and I, I did wonder if it might be sort of unresolved grief about the father given the context now i think it's very positive that the dreamer picks the doll up and brings it to the boyfriend that seems incredibly positive that this the dreamer is is willing and able even though the doll is creepy to sort of acknowledge its importance want to understand it better and can actually claim it can pick it up. That that feels like a really positive sign about the nature of the relationship between this person's conscious self and and her unconscious. And I I did too. I wondered about the the dreamer and uh, the dreamer's boyfriend and, and the father. And Joseph, I think you you could be so right on that after traumatic loss, right? That it like that it can be it can be, really be difficult for us to be close to someone. Also, thinking about leaving a relationship and, and any kind of ending is going to take us back to earlier endings. So even if you're the one leaving the relationship, it, it evokes this previous loss. So we're, we're in that realm of this, of this loss. It also feels important to me that the boyfriend doesn't feel so a dire about the doll I thought it was really interesting that the boyfriend's the one that said, I can feel your father here. You know, that in waking life, he's the one that's wondered, is there a father presence in the house? And, and he's the one somehow that maybe is mediating that experience a little bit for the dreamer. He's a little bit closer to this unresolved grief. And he can perhaps receive the doll and not feel as frightened by it. That all makes sense. And, I can see that the animus figure, although it's wearing the mask of the boyfriend, is serving a psychological place. The animus archetypally is the spirit of truth, which von Franz and Barbara Hanna do a wonderful job unpacking. So it may very well be that the symbol of the doll has a kind of truth embedded in it, that the animus figure could support the dream ego in integrating in some way. I'd also like to 
apply a kind of trauma model to this. When we experience a major trauma, particularly in childhood, a part of the soul, a part of the psyche, often can be cordoned off and put away in the unconscious because the feelings are so intolerable. So if we focus on the feeling of horror, we could all imagine being a child and having a father die tragically and the incredible intensity of pain and horror and all of that being too much, just too much for a child to metabolize, to make sense of, or even tolerate in their body. So there's a kind of saving grace that intercedes, takes those feelings, but also takes the experiencer of the feelings and puts it to sleep, so to speak, deep in the unconscious, much like the doll being put in the hallway. When it's time to reintegrate the lost aspect of ourselves, the self begins to draw this image, this piece of our lost selves back to us. And as that piece approaches the adult, the field of distressed memories begins to come back up in mind. And as adults, even though there's an enormous amount of anguish and fear and horror, many other nuances to it, it's more likely that our adult nervous system could tolerate those feelings and, and regulate them and think about them and bring some meaning to them that we couldn't, of course, do as a child. What I think is important is that who we were right before that intolerable experience is the part of us that is put away because that's the experiencer. So I'm just going to have a, a fantasy that the part of her that loved and adored her father, that felt that he was you know, the whole world in the way that little girls can feel at certain stages of their development, this ability to just throw her arms out when dad comes home from work and just kind of squeal with a delight, that that's the part that's so attached. So consequently, that's also the part that is most devastated by the tragic separation. So if we can tolerate moving through the barbed wire surrounding that part, she might be able to remember, oh gosh, before the tragedy, I was that girl. I was the girl who threw her arms out that couldn't wait for Dad to come home. I was the one who just would stab her feet in delight. And I forgot that I used to be that girl, that there was a time that was actually me. And that, that little capacity gets put to sleep. The personality still goes on. And she's uh, an aspiring artist. She's healthy. She has good relationships. But there's a little ability to throw one's arms out that goes to sleep. So on the other side of doing that bit of trauma work might be the restoration of that kind of a capacity that is just so core to the relationship with the love object. So as you said, Lisa, the dream is very hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I think it signals the beginning of a process that mm -hmm. needs to have support to yeah. continue to unfold. Yeah. Well, we really, I think both of us feel moved by this dream, and we really wish the dreamer all the best. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, 
Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.